Hi everybody, this is Erica Mello and welcome to episode number 78 of Tough to Treat. Before I get into the episode, Susan and I want to thank everybody who has left us testimonials on iTunes or wherever you listen to to our podcast. It's a, a great way for people to to search for us and to find us on any podcasting platform. So so keep them coming. We, we truly appreciate it. And for those of you who are listening to the podcast for the first time, we have a website. It's called, pretty, pretty straightforward, <laughs> toughtotreat.com. And when you join our email list, you automatically get a, my gosh, I think it's maybe 10 pages, maybe a little bit more of a clinical pearls PDF that I wrote on treating, on assessing and treating a complex patients. And a couple of PDFs that Susan wrote on sleep and persistent pain. We all know that people who, who suffer from, from pain tend to have, have sleeping, have issues with sleep. So these are great PDFs uh, for your reference. So the website again is www.toughtotreat.com and we're also going to be launching something really special in the fall. So hop on the newsletter and you'll get first wind of that as well. So on to the episode. This is was one of our pace, oh gosh, one of our most popular Facebook lives that we did based on the number of views and comments that we received in our podcast group on Facebook. It was, uh, it's about you know tennis elbow lateral epicondylitis. Uh, it, it's it, you know we we titled it demystifying tennis elbow because I've had it. It's extremely frustrating for 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 people for patients as well as providers and and I think that. It, we all have seen our share of tennis elbow patients over the years and Susan and I really discuss or we really unpack some of the myths around tennis elbow and, and, and talk a little bit more about treatment. So we hope you enjoy it. Yeah, so today, we're going to talk a little bit about um, lateral elbow pain <coughs> and how it can be just a little bit on the tricky side. So yes. I'm thinking of a couple of clients that I've had recently that have all come in with, you know, holding the side of their arm and telling mm. me that that's where they hurt. <coughs> Excuse me. That's and okay. usually, I'm just looking down. And usually by the time they get to me, that's pretty chronic. So they've had it for a good long time. And um, they're having difficulty doing all kinds of things. But the biggest thing that really brings them into the office finally, excuse me just a minute, go ahead and talk to her. That's okay. No, is, uh, is lateral <laughs> elbow pain. So we've gotten, uh, you know, when I was posting the, when I was doing the Canva graphic, I'm like, you know, lateral elbow pain, I've had it myself. And of course, typically, oh, it'll get better. It'll get better. It'll get better. You know, and I'm doing my radial nerve glides in the shower, you know, <laughs> this is years ago. And uh, very, and I often find that when you really palpate those tendons, it's really, really, really sore. And, and I, I don't necessarily think doing friction massage on, the, on, the, on those extensor tendons is like really helpful, it, to be honest. I mean, you may need blood flow, but for me, uh, I tend to have a sensitive system. That doesn't really help personally. So do you want to continue soon? Or do you want yeah, to yeah, thank you. Sorry, it's a little bit of um, oh, that's okay. allergies going on here. Oh, I know. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is the, the, what really brings them in to finally see me, or at least the last several people I've had with this issue, is that they can't sleep at night. Ah, They're waking up in pain with it, with it hurting in the nighttime and it's really bugging them and, and bothering them or they're waking up in the morning and it's just killing them. Um, and so, you know, just, you know, which always kind of clues me into, okay, maybe this started, you know, in that tissue area around the extensor brevis muscle or attachment or things like that. But perhaps maybe it is actually, um, you know, become much more of a sensitized nervous system. Yeah. And I think that's probably why you're talking about the, you know, doing the deep friction massage right on the brevis can be exquisitely tender, but it also may be the, too much input to a system that's now kind of converted over to kind of maybe, even if it's not a central sensitization, at least a peripheral sensitization. Yes. You yes. know, where the, where the peripheral nerve has really gotten quite sensitive, you yeah. know, through that area. And I think what really ends up starting to happen with people at nighttime is one positioning and number two, what's going on with their neck. 
And yeah. if they're going into neck extension and weird things at nighttime, is that firing off that sensitive, you know, from the, you know, like, is that nerve sensitive all the way up into the, to the cervical area, you know, mm -hmm. through the brachial plexus and up into the cervical plexus and mm -hmm. really getting people kind of straightened out a little bit at nighttime can be quite helpful because the other thing people do at night is curl up. Right. You I know, do that. and we have a natural <laughs> tendency. We have, everyone does. It's a natural tendency to move into a flexion pattern at nighttime. Yeah. That's part of sleeping. And so really trying to help them uh, change that is really quite hard because no one's going to stop doing this. So I found that splinting, at least for the nighttime piece, splinting has been very, very, very helpful. Splinting and you don't need to, the elbow? The wrist. Oh, the wrist. Yeah, because oh. it keeps them from doing this. So I've been doing, I've been playing around with that. That seems to work really, really well for people who are A, driving a lot and B, mm -hmm. having problems in bed. I like uh, that. The other time I see with people driving is there's a lot of, you know, reaching down like this to get to the, the gear shift. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if they're just going from park to, to drive, uh, people on the steering wheel, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of things that, that go on that way. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the first, the first thing that I do with people is uh, figure out when they're the most symptomatic. And if it's usually positional, like in bed, um, you know, or driving the car or something that, you know, uh, it's really hard to wear a splint if you're working. Like, you know, yeah. we have to work on other things with that. But when it's things like nighttime <clears throat> or lifting and carrying and, you know, doing those kinds of activities and a splint can really, really, really help because yeah. all it does is keeps the, keeps the wrist from going into further flexion so that the nerve can actually, you know, the, ner you know, the nerve in the tissue can actually kind of settle down. Any recommendations on like a short, like a, like a, you know, short yep. one? Yeah, I just, you know, what I tell people to do is go to, and I'd love to hear any comments anybody has out there too on this. I just have people go over to the drugstore and grab one of those splints that Velcro's over. Oh, yes, you know? yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the cheap, you know, the, the really inexpensive Dr. Scholl's whatever wrist splint. Oh, I like that. Um, yeah, and it doesn't even have to be a cock-up splint. It's just, just something to hold them still so at nighttime they just aren't going to flex so much they're still yeah. gonna you know they may do this you know but they'll do it like this they won't do you know the whole position mm -hmm. you know, with uh, with the arm down yeah um, yep. because you know that's that's the test for this right for lateral elbow pain is you know you know extended elbow you know and then we're taking the arm mm -hmm. into extension and a little internal rotation, rotation. and really flexing Yes. The wrist to see if that yes. fires up. Well, that's also a radial nerve tension test. Yes. <laughs> that's what helped me. I did those in the shower. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so what, what I'm looking to do is to limit the radial tension, the radial nerve tension, tension. in the yeah. system in the short run to get things to settle down. Mm -hmm. Because I, th that by the time I see them, they're so flared up. Yeah. If they can't eat, they, nothing's helping, you yeah. know, I mean, they can't do tensionings, they can't do sliders, they can't do gliders. It just hurts. All they want to do is grab it, yeah. you know, yeah. and it just really kills them. Yeah. Well, yeah. I found that that is like really helpful <clears throat> in the beginning to get people to really settle down. Yeah. And what you know, what kills me is that people they're, they're like, Oh, I might, we did this, we did this and all these stretches. And I'm like, and they didn't help. And I was like, well, right you know, you're, you're really stretching strained tissue. I don't really think that's going to help, you know? So right. uh, it just kills me that people still, I mean, these are the people who are persistent, right? But even mm -hmm. with an acute epicondylitis, I wouldn't be stretching those wrist extensions. You're, you're protect, you know, in an acute situation, you're protecting, you know, yeah. you still have to follow the normal physiology of tissue healing. So maybe during the chronicity, it's moved to a chronic state, but they still have a lot of, um, you know, now you've got structures that maybe are not you know, you don't, or not, maybe not getting strained anymore, but they've become super sensitive to the movement pattern. Right, exactly, exactly. <clears throat> and and so, I, mm -hmm. no, go ahead, Susan. No, that's okay. So that's why I chose to start, you know, I've played around with taping the wrist. I've played around with taping the lateral epicondyle yeah. into a little bit of, you know, the, the elbow into a little bit of flexion, um, you know, taping the wrist into a little bit of extension. People like that, but it's, it's not a great long-term strategy for somebody right. who's really hurting. Yeah. Um, I found that wearing the splint, particularly at nighttime, makes a huge difference for people. Yeah, that's great advice. Because <clears throat> if they can get advice. to sleep, they can yeah. start getting better. Yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, then so I get them to settle down like that a little bit. And then now we can talk a little. So that's kind of what I do first thing. 
is, is get them more comfortable immediately mm -hmm. as fast as I can. And then we can start working on the tissues. Mm -hmm. So now we can start talking about some of the things you were talking about just a minute ago that you had tried on yourself. What are your go-to things? What do you like to do? What do you like to like, how do you like to progress them? Me? Uh, who else, Erica? <laughs> um, personally, I don't do, like in the exam, I'll go in and I'll assess the tissue, but I often, you know, go right to the neck, to be honest. I think there's a lot of, I mean, I'll just pick up a patient of mine. She had, she picked up a dumbbell on a gym a while ago and she literally just developed this, 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 this acute epicon lateral, lateral elbow pain mm -hmm. and she couldn't open a door. Your class, it couldn't grip. So I don't necessarily, I don't give them stretches. I actually give them radial nerve glides to start with. Mm -hmm. I have them do that. I don't splint, but I will know. I think that's a great idea. I, you know, I, I hadn't thought of that, uh, especially with people who have problems sleeping. I tend to, uh, sometimes I'll tell, they'll come in with those, you know, those, those elbow, those um, show mm -hmm. pad straps. And I don't think those particularly help. Sometimes they just feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And as long as it doesn't, you know, put, make them worse, I'll do that. But what initially, uh, I will try some of these, these mulligan mobilizations, you know, some of the distraction mobilizations, some of the mobilizations with the, for the radial ulnar joint with gripping. Sometimes that help desensitizes the tissue. I've had some success with that um, mm -hmm. in, in his book on an, um, MWM's Mill a Milligan. Mulligan had, you know, sort of walks you through these. And I've had success with that primarily with gripping, mostly with gripping. Uh, and then I'll to progress them through, I'll get on their neck and I'll assess their neck. And what I, while I'm, you know, either working on their neck, I'll have them go through the radial nerve glide mm -hmm. or median nerve glide or any glides when I'm on their neck, either doing a little bit of distraction, depending on what I find there, I'll mm -hmm. have them do the distal movement while I'm working centrally. So I've done that fairly often. Uh, Patients of mine have asked me about these eccentric exercises for the wrist. And mm -hmm. I do, I give them out. I don't think that some of them are helpful. Uh, I know there's a lot of research out there on, you know, it depends on, you know, where it, tendon injury or it, the state of the tendon when you see them, but they've not hurt. So I will, I will give them out. But in terms of manual work, I do very little tendon unless it's a significant tendinopathy and the person's not really hurting, uh, and, but there's significant restriction, I, I won't generally go in there and start frictioning the tendon at the beginning mm -hmm. at all. I think it really flares them up. Uh, I actually work more proximal. I work on the, the shoulders. I have found that there have been some, some, some issues, particularly in the posterior cuff with people who lack elbow, um, excuse me, who lack shoulder external rotation. They'll, they'll, they'll get up mostly at the medial epicondyle, but um, the medial condyle, but not so much on the lateral, but they, they, they lack some rotational movement, either internal or external, and they'll compensate at the elbow. So what I'll do is I'll go up in the shoulder, I'll assess the tissue and see if there's any sort of, not trigger, not referral pattern, but any sort of restriction that I mm -hmm. could link to the elbow. So I'll have them do some internal, external rotation, I'll assess the elbow. And you know, at the end of the day, you are doing internal and external when you are mobilizing the radial nerve. So what mm -hmm. I found is I work more shoulder and neck with nerve glides rather than local, except for those mulligan mobilizations and maybe some eccentrics. That's what yeah, I and, tend to do. And, and I like that because what you're doing is you're actually tensioning the system from another direction. Yeah. <clears throat> you're taking them into a little uh, distraction. You're taking them into some side bending, maybe rotation away you know, as you're kind of getting them to kind of feel and see how that's affecting down the arm rather than going at the wrist and really working it so hard here, because that seems to trigger off the pain so much more that you can kind of settle it by kind of like trying, let's try tensioning it from the other end. And we've talked a lot about that in some of our podcasts about, you know, if you've got some lower extremity neural tension things that are going on and you can't really reproduce it by doing tensioning in the leg, but you start winding up the system from above, mm -hmm. then you can actually kind of draw that, you know, you, you start, you're able to actually kind of start, you know, getting better tension into the, the, you know, the neural system down below. So what you're doing is just actually kind of like doing the distractions and the tensioning and the gliders from above mm -hmm. to begin to help settle that sensitivity down further down the arm. I also like your point about the shoulder, because I was going to talk about that Although, you know, we talked about the knee kind of being the transitional zone for the, 
like hip and foot, like it, you know, oftentimes you have to go to the knee and see what the knee is doing because if it's not moving well, that may yeah. be why their hip is kind of flaring up or their foot is, you know, is, is being reactive in, in certain ways. Well, you know, the elbow is a transitional zone too. However, I think I agree with you. I think that sometimes a lot of the elbow stuff is triggered by a lack of movement or, or a movement pattern that's kind of just gotten ingrained, like a dominant movement pattern in the shoulder. <clears throat> because of the rotational stuff, if we have a shoulder that doesn't really want to go into internal rotation, then we're going to be over cranking, mm -hmm. you know, maybe perhaps overworking tissues or doing something a little bit different down in mm -hmm. the, the lower part with the pronation supination mm -hmm. to make up for the rotation that may not be occurring up above mm -hmm. for whatever reason. It could yes. be an old injury and it's a compensation pattern that they've developed over time yes. and over the years. Or it could be something coming from the neck that has caused a, an inhibition or a weakness, yep. you know, a, a local weakness in the shoulder, in some of the shoulder muscles. So they're not working in concert together anymore. Yep. And I think that's a super important point is, you know, taking a look at them and like, show me, you know, if they're like, show me when you hurt, tell me when you hurt, tell me where it hurts, tell me what activities you're doing now, show me that activity. You know, let me see you do it. Let me see what's happening here. And sometimes you may see them like really spread their arms out a whole lot. And, um, you know, or they may need to, you know, or maybe they're bringing their arms in too much, or maybe they're like dropping over, or maybe they're doing something weird up here. You know, I, it's just always, I never know what I'm going to see until I see it. And then yeah. it's kind of like, why are you doing that? <laughs> What's the effort behind that? Right. But generally, I think some of the things that happen though with people over time is that, they just get into some sort of, you know, they're either trying to work a shoulder and, and the shoulder isn't, you know, so they, they just have found a different way to move due to a shoulder problem. Correct. And I had a, and I had a patient who she was a, a really good golfer. I mean, that wasn't her, you know, she wasn't like a professional athlete, but I will tell you, she played golf all the time and she, I've cheated her on and off for different, different issues she developed this chronic elbow pain and turns out she had a lack of external rotation in her shoulder. So whenever mm -hmm. she went to the follow through, you know, she would externally rotate that arm and it would really be more medial elbow pain. But at the end of the day, it's really important to assess the shoulder. And what I've also, what I'm also finding, especially in, in well, not just necessarily throwers, but people who just th throw with their children, you know, or play catch with their kids, Mm -hmm. Even when you get them into a weight bearing, let's say a wall push up, that's going to automatically, you know, flare, not flare, that they're going to feel it. So I believe that, you know, not only do you need to do, need, do these open chains, you need to do progressive loading on the wall and you can have them do, uh, you know, you can have them just literally have their hands in a closed chain on the wall and walk sideways, walk, you know, to the right, to the left. And that mm -hmm. will tension and like, and then do a squat. So you're going to do your lower extremity nerve guides, but your, your elbows, your arms are in a position where they're on tension or they're on slack. You can raise them up. You can turn them around. And those are great ways of mobilizing the nerves from below. Yeah, I love that because that's that's changing it up instead of going above, coming at that nerve from a whole different direction or that that area from a different direction from below, and that even adding in some things like uh, head turns and and side oh, bendings yeah. can can really pull that in too, and I, I like the weight bearing part. And one of the reasons I like the weight bearing with the open hand, is some of the true true kind of st that it really started in the you know the brevis you know, muscle, maybe an overworking or overloading comes from people who are grippers. Yeah. So I have seen a number of um, people in construction that, mm. you know, they just, they're, they're gripping and it's the gripping that gets them. They're yeah. not the typical like people on the computer all the time and what they call, you know, the uh, competitive trauma overload, you know, the, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, sorry, repetitive. Uh, you know, trauma overload or those types of things, but they're people who grip and gripping is can be very painful for some of these people that, you know, the activity of going back to holding. And so that's where I kind of, you know, question so much going straight into eccentrics because it's not an eccentric movement that's driving them crazy. It's the gripping and beginning to, so I love the weight bearing with the hands out first because it begins to help them load the mm -hmm. tissue 
in a non-gripping, non-painful kind of position, which I think is really important. Of course, it pulls in the whole chain and the shoulder and getting, you know, everything on. And like you said, you know, some nerve gliding from a different direction. But then one of the things that I like to do is get them back moving towards a nice um, uh, uh, gripping type position, you know, where they're starting, you know, so maybe we'll start on something a little bit bigger, mm -hmm. you know, and really having them kind of, you know, and then having them load that and move it around like they would, you know, whatever it is that they're doing and then work them into smaller and smaller things. And people who lift weights oftentimes run into this too, because they're gripping the weight so hard. Um, and it may be they're gripping the weight hard because it's a little too heavy for them to lift. And it's a compensatory pattern that they've kind of done to like, ah, oh, I can't lift it. So I'm going to grip harder. Yeah. And it's like, maybe you should like lower the weight a little bit so that you, you know, and let's get the gripping going again so that you're not over gripping as you're kind of trying to work whatever else it is that you're working. Yeah. We have some comments in here. Oh, I don't see. Oh, here they go. So uh, thank you, Annette, for coming in. And we're so glad that you like the podcast and what we're talking about. Uh, uh, Oh, thank Doreen. you for doing hey, that sorry um and doreen welcome uh oh, doreen. she says <laughs> that she just uh, great suggestion so far have you talked yet of myofascial restrictions in the wrist extensor group that may need to be addressed also with dry lead dry needling the doreen's and... up in my montreal right i think doreen we're in montreal mm -hmm. uh, uh to desensitize the system and mobilizing the nerves yep we were just talking about that <clears throat> four point kneel with kneel. the hands and wrists in a variety of positions yes exactly Doreen and I like when I was talking about that I like going flat first and then I eventually like what Erica was talking about on the wall I was going to say I like bringing them into a fist onto the wall so oh, that yes. they're kind of loading you know we're kind of working back into those positions that they need or, or on their hands and knees mm -hmm. you know can be great or if they can't get on their knees you know we can do it on a tabletop and those things work. And yeah, we did talk early about um, a sensitive system that, you know, we were looking at ways to kind of just really get that system to calm down. And certainly dry needling can be one of them. I don't dry needle. So we can't I'll leave that up to the, to the yeah. experts that do do that. But it's a great modality for those people. And then, you know, uh, the myofascial restriction stuff comes into kind of like working that whole upper quarter and kind of like Erica was talking about the shoulder and some of that as well. Thank you for your comments. Awesome. I love the, I love the hands and knees. Um, yeah, I, that's a great mm -hmm. idea. And uh, it's anything to, to mix it up. And I also think that, you know, we always think about the, the periphery and, and we work centrally, but think about, you know, if you've got, if you have a movement strategy, you've been doing forever, whether you're a professional athlete, a weekend athlete, or just, you know, or not an athlete, or you, you're really right-handed, could be that your upper, you know, I'm going to go to the thorax again, as we all know, you know, your upper ribs, mm -hmm. it, it could be that you have lost of control through here. So when you're, when you're, you know, writing or when you're sitting, Put some, you know, balloons under your armpits or not balloons, balls under your armpits or towels under your armpits to decompress the upper ribs. And that may help give you more mobility and more control in, 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 in you know, in those open chain movements. And when you're on your hands and knees, you could use the imagery, the scapula floating off the rib cage and, and do some really funky movements um, as well. So I think that uh, you need to sort of keep that in mind because where the whole plexus is. And I think getting, you know, it decongested or decompressed up there is probably not a bad idea either. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I'm just thinking about the more of the weight bearing stuff. Uh, Cause I really yeah. like that. Uh, I'm just thinking out loud here. So <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's great. And the other thing to kind of think about is, is it really in it? So that that's where we really have that tissue problem that's originating, you know, in that lateral, uh, epicondyl or lateral you know area the extensor muscles or the extensor brevis i think has been coined the culprit um guy but you know kind of why that's set up in the first place but the other thing to consider is that it may really seriously be an issue in the cervical spine and um oftentimes we can get a lot of lateral epicondyl pain you know pain coming down you know from a c5 c6 restriction you know, mm -hmm. C6, C7 restriction, uh, you know, maybe some spurring or something that's happening around the nerve root that has really got it. And you may not have any neck pain at all. <clears throat> may just, right. have, you know, and so we're talking lateral, you know, stenosis there or lateral spurring maybe, but sometimes we can have a little bit of a central piece that may give it down both arms. Mm -hmm. So whenever mm -hmm. I see it on one side and then they're starting to complain on the other side, that's usually a clue to me that we need to really get up and and really kind of figure out what's going on in the neck and uh, help them get out of compression and 
maybe open things up and change it and get some muscle built up around that area as well. Like you were talking about getting some movement in those upper ribs and like the cervicothoracic area. Yep. If you can free that up, I mean, we have clinical prediction rules that say if you can free up the T-spine, the cervical spine is really going to react much better. And it's because mm -hmm. the base on it isn't quite so being held so stiff. Yep. Yep. And being able to, to kind of do that. But I think that that's important too. And then so your neuroscreen is really important. Um, you know, and you can do a pretty good neuroscreen without, you know, getting them painful. I mean, you can still test finger extension. You don't have to test it way back here where maybe they can't get up because of the pain, like it hurts too bad to pull it all the way up. But maybe mm -hmm. you can, you know, get in neutral and test, you know, finger extension and, you know, some wrist extension. And again, mm -hmm. I like to go back and test flexion because, yes, you know, it, oftentimes this comes on, you know, with, with, with gripping. Gripping. It's because yes. there's so much tension here to maintain that grip in that position and to do that work, whatever work they may be gripping around um, can be really important as well. So really being able to do your neuro screening and make sure that you don't have something, uh, uh, um, what do I want to say? Um, not, not, not sensory finisher. change. Yeah. Yeah. Not, uh, not irritable, but uh, something that may be more neurological like power outage. Um, going yeah. on, you know, so you've got a very sensitive nerve, but you also have the power outage going on because right. it's, being, it's being compressed somewhere along the chain. Mm -hmm. Correct. And I know David Butler in, in uh, one of his books, he has, I often give this one out. He talks about doing juggling and doing like twirly hoop, like, um, you know, mm -hmm. figure eights in the air to, just throughout your day, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's central or peripheral, those are just good ways to refresh the whole, the homunculus and, ref and refresh and flush the tissues out. So I do give out a lot of his, you know, glides mm -hmm. because I think that just helps fr from a local perspective uh, to really flush the tissue. And, you know, I'm often wondering, do, when do we as therapists address if there is a significant tendinopathy in that tendon, whether it's from an overuse or, or a traumatic injury and just gone wrong or just not treated, when do we actually address that tendon? When do we start to do that? Because you know, it's clear from the research that there, you know, tendinopathies exist, but when mm -hmm. do we focus on that as a profession? Even though we may think it's cervical spine with a secondary elbow, but we need to we need to address that, don't you think? Yeah. I, I, so my my thing is first, I want to get them symptomatically settled down a little bit, so we know where what we're dealing with. Because you know, when it's all over the place, it just needs to settle down for me yeah. anyway. And then I can say, okay, do we need to get more into the elbow piece of it? Um, is it a gripping thing? You know, is it a full you know upper quarter thing? Is it a cervical spine thing, you know, kind of tease that out. And I, I still think that, you know, it's kind of like with, you know, with any other tendinopathy, we need to think about how we're going to do it. I like the gripping as coming through for those that are, that are having the issue with gripping or have had it around gripping, because I think mm -hmm. that's what you need to address mm -hmm. more than the tendon. But for the people who are having the, you know, having a real tendinopathy at that brevis tendon yes, and, you know, all the... Uh, you know, we know that we're not going to change a tendinopathy tendon. We have to build up around it. Correct. Um, is, the, is the science behind the eccentric stuff. Yes. But my thing is, is that I, you know, again, I don't like to drop all the way into a full eccentric because again, then you're having to grip something too. So yes. I may just start with the hand and with a band on the hand so that the fingers can be extended. So you can, you can have the hand on a table, yep. put the band on it. So it's coming down this way. And then they have to work again, you know, they or you can hold the band up here and they have to work down against the band. You can do a number of different things to begin to address mm -hmm. loading of that tendon in an open position and then work into a closed position. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, my humble opinion, I think people jump to the grip and eccentric work way too soon. I agree. Because you've got two things going on at once. Yep. And I would I like agree. to see them work open handed more and then work into the grip or start with. Uh, working for, uh, you know, work, maybe if you're going to start with the grip, work with the grip and get it going better and then start adding the movement. So you can yeah. start either way, open handed with moving the wrist or starting with a grip and progressing the grip and then eventually adding the wrist. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I agree. I don't so, think there's any, there's never been anything like saying this is better than this or this is better than this. Right. But we do need to load the tendon eventually we, yes. to build up enough stuff around the tendon to be protective. Yeah. 
I'm just looking at the comment, Doreen, it writes, um, brachialis, fascia, restrictions are also fairly frequent, lateral elbow pain, yes, mm -hmm. you know, for sure, yes to cervical and thoracic intervention, get those rings aligned. Doreen and I have taken courses together with LJ Lee and Diane Lee, so she, I've, I've been on a couple courses with her, and agree with Susan, wait for things to settle down before addressing the tendinopathy uh, with eccentric program when I do start it often it's not it's often it's with one or two pounds not exactly not, not much exactly 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 sometimes for me it's even just you know like uh, do you have a can of you know an eight ounce can <clears throat> exactly. because it's a nice open grip I like cans because it's an open grip so it starts to bring that in but mm -hmm. it's also light you know so what do you have that's lighter because you know you just have to kind of figure out what they can tolerate and and what they can do um, I've never been real successful in heavy loading of the tendon early in, in, in the nope. lateral elbow. Nope, me I've just, not, I just haven't, I have, I've tried it a number of times. It hasn't worked for me clinically, which is why I backed off and thought they need to settle down. We need to figure out kind of where we really, you know, where is like you like to call it so lovely all the time, where maybe this whole thing set up from like the symptoms are being expressed here, but why? Right. Is it because that tissue is in trouble and it was in trouble or is it because that tissue started to, to become sensitive and painful because of something else that they've, that, that whole movement system was compensating for, yeah. you I, know, and you can do it until you can't. And then when you can't, you become symptomatic and we got to find another way to do it. Yeah. And I think by the time they get to us, because there are many people out there who, and myself included, you know, you get elbow pain, you think it's going away. And a month goes by and it's go, it's still there and you're mm -hmm. going to the doctor and then you're coming, whatever. By the time they get to us, they're, they're at least three months, four months, sometimes a year. Already had injections. Yeah, and exactly. And, and mm -hmm. they haven't, oh, I'm not doing a bicep curl. I'm fine. You know, oh, it's just when I lift something. So their tissues and there's so much congestion in the arm and mm -hmm. in the plexus, the neck and the thorax and the shoulder. You, you cannot, this is my opinion, my humble opinion. You cannot just treat the elbow and it, yeah. it won't get better. It will not get better. So... Mm -hmm term but you the person's going to have to come and come and come and come so you need to address the congestion in the tissues whether that's you know aligning your upper you know your upper rings as we call their upper ribs or, mm. or working on your neck and doing some distal movement pain-free or you know or just adding d novel input into the system when appropriate you know either in the hands and knees but just introducing that movement you need to look i mean i've not seen a connection in i'm sure they exist but you know between the foot and the elbow i've not seen that in my practice but uh if someone has elbow pain when they're squatting and and for example they're lifting weights i'm looking at their squat and i'm looking at the rest of their chain but it's mostly with the gripping or or with some form of upper extremity movement mm -hmm. and you need you know to progress them through those weight bearing postures yeah and load the system eventually because you need to go through the whole program with these people right and i think what's interesting about that and and what doreen was talking about too with the on the hands and knees or if they can't get on their knees loaded onto a countertop and um the the important thing here is to remember is that when people have painful elbows and it may not be the elbow joint that's painful we're talking about soft tissue pain nerve yeah. pain kind of stuff here you know it's really not the elbow joint no. that's you know that's that's gone wrong here or has gone funky or whatever has gotten symptomatic um but what what is important here is that when people are hurting they're, they're gonna it's almost like if you think about like a dog that has a hurt paw you know they're reluctant to put it down yeah you know we're not talking about the paw pain here but it's the same with the elbow I've noticed that people quit, like when they go to even get up out of bed, they won't even push, you know, they, they have stopped, you know, they don't even like to pull and push doors open. Yes. That's that whole piece that's really, you know, and that's what starts to set in. And then all of a sudden we have to start thinking about, wow, that tissue now is also being, is the, the bigger problem for it is now it's being chronically unloaded you know, yeah. cause they're in the lack of use, you know, so it's not mm -hmm. getting loaded as much as it should be. And we don't realize how much we use our arms for weight bearing instability and, you know, and, uh, you know, and compression and moving yeah. and approximation and all of that stuff. Um, but we have to, you know, we, we, until we kind of like start to look at them and if we don't put them in these positions, we'll never know. And yeah. I see, I know a lot of people just grab the arm and, you know, start mobilizing the tissue and the, you know, the lateral elbow and start doing it. To, you know, I'm kind of more of a show me when and how and why it hurts. It hurts mm -hmm. when I push a door open, show me. 
when you think about it, that's the rate. Know me. That, you know, I need to exactly. see it. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's I want to see what they're doing or what they're not doing. It's like, right. what if you, <laughs> what if we like, look at this, maybe you start pushing the door. Does it hurt? Let's figure out a way for you to push that door open. So it doesn't hurt, but we can actually start loading. Yeah, it's the same as if when you're standing and you have a left foot injury and you're, you know, you're, you're weight bearing on your right leg. So when you have a, let's say a left elbow injury, you know, you're going to be, your body scheme is going to be biased more towards that right side. Cause you're going to do everything with your right arm. At least that's, that's what most people tell me. I just don't use it. So I use my right. And so what happens to that left side? It, it loses its ability to adapt to movement. It, it can get stiff. It could get, you know, underused. It certainly gets underused, but it loses its ability to lap to adapt to movement and load. So, mm -hmm. you know, when do we, when, when is an acceptable level you know, of load for these people, you know, are you going to not, you're not going to start with long lever, you know, bicep curls, you're not going to start with long lever gripping 10 pound weight, that's going to just, you know, flare them up. Um, and I think Doreen wrote a quick comment about East, uh, I don't know if you could read that. Um, yeah, to me, the magic eccentric. number is four. If the patient has an increase in discomfort from the eccentric exercise, it's acceptable as long as it's as and long as it's yeah intensity <laughs> yeah as long as it is four or less on a scale of what you know one to ten that it's that you have some symptoms yes. but they're not like spiking yeah. like you know really you yeah. know neuropathic type symptoms yeah if it's more than that decrease the number of reps or decrease the weight absolutely scale it back that. down and some of this is test retest for sure yeah. because you don't know until you start Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to, you, you want to kind of meet them where they are. And that means you may have to go really low in the beginning, but as you progress, you have to kind of like play with that a little bit and say, okay, have we adapted enough that we can actually increase the reps now and increase the, increase the, you know, weight bearing or, the, or whatever it is that we're they're gripping or whatever it is that we're the weight that they're gripping or whatever they're lowering, you know, at yeah. that point. And um, one of the other things is that I, I wanted to say with the exercises is that, you know, if this, extension internal rotation and 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 uh, flexion i don't know if everybody can see but you know this kind of positioning mm -hmm. is the test for it then why are we not exercising them in that position <laughs> you know so the shoulder extensors yep. you know maybe perhaps the triceps you know mm -hmm. we've got to get some other thing you know maybe it's that that's where that whole chain comes in right so you're doing that this yeah rate. Yep. yeah so you can do yeah. like a skull crusher or a Mm -hmm. uh, or elbow. maybe even just putting their hand in and, their coat <laughs> or yeah. in their shirt, you know, d you know, things like that. Those, those are natural movements, you know, reaching behind and grabbing things. A lot mm -hmm. of times people will reach behind and reach down to grab mm -hmm. something behind them on the floor or whatever. And so I think you looking at those functional movement patterns that go behind the body are really mm -hmm. as important as some of the ones that are in front of the body or, you know, above, like we're kind of used to working more. You know, so maybe even like being able to sit back and weight bear back on the arm, mm -hmm. oh, uh, yes. you know, like, so you can start, you know, so yes. they can sit back, you know, because I see and that like a, a lot with people. Hook lying. You mean like a hook, yeah, line, like hook, line? hook yeah. line, you know, they can sit back or they can just long sit back or they can sit in a chair and come back, you know, just kind of like, if you, if you reach behind you and it hurts, show me, let me see what it is and let's yes. figure it out. Show me how you're getting in and out of bed. Yeah. And that usually you hurts. Know, yeah. And, you know, because they're, or they're, or they're completely not using their arm, yeah, yeah. you know, because it hurts. So yeah. it's like, well, well, let's figure this out. Let's, let's figure out which piece you're not doing and let's start beginning to load that and start getting that in there again. Yeah. You could also take like, and even just take your arm and do like shoulder, um, you know, internal, I mean, just get really, just really sort of tension the, this left, mm -hmm. this on uh, my left arm here and just do some internal external rotation with a band and getting as far back, I'm a bit stiff, but a bit as far back as you can. And even going down like that mm -hmm. as well, like you mentioned earlier, I think that those are great ideas going behind mm -hmm. the body because that's what really helps. So if you think about the weight bearing, you could go on your elbows, you could probably, I'm just thinking of anything else you could possibly do from, because I'm, you know, you, you could do a down dog, but that's definitely in front. Um, you could probably do some things, you know, facing away from the wall, having your hands behind the wall, almost like you're stretching your pecs out, which is doing some, you know, take, taking a TheraBand behind you, you know, my fa I'm, I'm facing away from the wall, my hands are behind me, and just doing some, some things with bands behind you as well, just to, you know, mm -hmm. just to give them, because some people want exercises, so you can trick their system and putting them in a position like, you know, 
behind your body, but doing something with the band or weights to, just to think that, you, yeah. know, you know, get them the sense that they're doing something. Mm -hmm. And a lot uh, of people like that. Yeah. A lot of people have trouble putting their coats on or their jackets on or their shirts on if you're living in the South right now yeah. or whatever, you know, they, they have head. trouble reaching behind them or, you know, doing um, those types of activities. So that's also a good way to kind of think about, you know, how function, you know, and functional activities can drive your treatment program just a bit more. Yeah. So any other questions or any other? I don't think so. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah, this was good. I like this. You know, we don't this see, was, yeah, mm -hmm. elbow. Yeah, I'm sorry, Susan. I just say that's you know, all right. Elbows are, and you know, sort of. We'll be talking issue. about this on a podcast soon. Yeah. Um, yeah our, so, because I've had a few of these come up, and I thought, you know, it's a good time to kind of start introducing the subject and seeing what other people think. Thank you, um, Annie, for watching, you, and thanks everybody. Yep. Thanks, and Doreen. Annette and Thank Doreen. You. And uh, yeah, leave your comments if you're seeing this a little bit later. Let us know what yeah, you think. We'd love um, to hear your thoughts. Have a great Thursday. Yeah, and hopefully yeah, we'll see you next week. <laughs> Sounds good. Bye, everybody.